morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started, even though people are still coming in. Um, I am Mary Hall from University of Utah, and it is my great honor to be able to introduce the FCRC 2019 plenary speakers. Um, these speakers were nominated by the FCRC conferences, and they were selected for the cross-disciplinary impact of their work. This is a really exciting time for designing systems that can scale to meet the challenges of the new applications that we heard about in the Turing Lecture last night and that we'll also hear about this week. Um, so we're going to look at these applications, we're going to look at the systems, and we're also going to look at the societal impacts of some of the work. Energy efficiency and the end of Moore's Law have inspired new and diverse computer architectures which have in turn inspired new ways to program and manage these systems. Today's talk envisions a creative solution to this challenge inspired by the brain's neocortex function. Our speaker is Jim Smith. He's an adjunct professor at Carnegie Mellon, Silicon Valley, uh, and he's uh, a professor emeritus at University of Wisconsin. Jim has been an integral part of the computer architecture community for uh, several decades, and he's navigated both the academic world and uh, worked uh, in industry designing architectures for CDC, ACA, Cray Research, and now and and also software companies Google and Intel. Um, his work significantly impacted the development of superscalar processors, for which he received the ACM IEEE eckert Mochley Award in 1999, and he's also a recent recipient of the Distinguished Achievement Award from the University of Illinois, where he received his PhD. He's known by the computer architecture community as a pathfinder, someone who leaps out ahead to explore the next uh, challenges for the field, and that's uh, no doubt what we're going to hear about today. With no further ado, I'll introduce Jim Smith. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm told that I have to do some corrective action here. Is that good? Okay, well, it's uh, certainly an honor to be given the opportunity to talk about the things I'm working on. I'd like to thank Mary and, uh, for uh, this opportunity and also Hillary, um, Bobby, Eric. I'm told my friend Joel Emmer was also partially responsible for uh, putting my name forward. This is, this is um, um, something I've been working on for a, a few years and uh, it's, uh, I'm as excited about it now as I was when I started. Um, and, but um, I must say, the, uh, you know, the Turing Lecture is a, a rather hard act to follow, you know, especially given the topic of this talk. And, and it, 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 it um, then as I, I guess it's kind of appropriate that I, that I quote, that I have this quote from uh, Carver Mead. And, uh, the work I'm doing follows this principle. And this principle, I, I, I think, is actually quite different from uh, the, the principles that now underlie conventional artificial neural networks. Um, although, although I think neural, I wasn't there at the time, but although I think neural networks you know, started out with this principle, it's kind of diverged over the years. And I don't think that many artificial neural network people today would argue that it really uh, that neural networks really emulate, despite their success, really emulate the way that the, uh, that the brain actually works. So uh, in a sense, you know, the work I'm doing is almost like a, like a master reset. You know, let's go back, you know, let's start again. And, and, and furthermore, you know, the way, the way neurons in the brain works has evolved quite a lot since the first neural networks were put forward. So uh, let's go back and kind of start, you know, from this principle and, uh, and see what we, what we can do. It's um, my opinion that, you know, that, that all the good features of the brain that we'd like to have, and I'm going to list them shortly, 
uh, rest on the, on the underlying foundation. And if you don't have these principles at the start in the foundations of the, uh, of the paradigm, they're not going to magically appear later as, as the paradigm evolves. So the, the motivation, I, I don't think you really need much motivation for this topic, but the, uh, you know, the, the human brain is capable of accurate sensory perception, you know, input, high-level reasoning and, and problem-solving, processing, and then driving complex motor activity output. But it, but it also has some very impressive features, you know, you know 20 watts um, from an engineering perspective. It, it's, it's incredible. It's flexible. It learns dynamically, quickly, concurrently with operation, and it, it far exceeds anything conventional machine learning has achieved. And so, the, so, uh, so one of the, the questions is, will the trajectory of conventional machine learning ever achieve the same capabilities? Or should we look for new approaches on the way the brain actually works? And that, I guess that's you know, kind of the, the, where the master reset comes in. Let's, let's you know, have another go at it. And um, as, as, as further motivation, this, uh, the, the title of this talk was Roadmap. So, uh, and, and if, if you want to emulate, you know, all the operations of the, uh, of the brain or the neocortex, that's a tremendous, you know, order. So, um, I'm putting forward first, it's kind of the first major milestone, which is, you know, much more modest in, uh, in the objective. And uh, so, so the, the first milestone temporal neural network is to be able to provide continual unsupervised clustering. We're, 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 we're basically, by clustering we mean we're going to learn and identify similar input patterns and then map them to concise um, cluster identifiers. And, and the point is that training and inference are done concurrently and continually. So you take a sequence of, in, of input patterns, you, you uh, perform inference, you, you, you basically compress it down to a, uh, to a simple cluster identifier, but then you also feed the, input, the, the output back around, combine it with the input pattern, and you adjust synaptic weights to either uh, further refine the clusters you've got, or if the uh, patterns should change at a, a sort of a macro level, to adjust for that. And so, so maybe, maybe the clustering changes dynamically over time. Um, it's going to be emergent. All the neural operations are local, and, and somehow global behavior emerges. We want a hardware implementation that's fast, energy efficient, and we would like to implement it with conventional digital CMOS. Now, I, 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 I should emphasize that this is, um, if we achieve this, it's really only a processing core. It's not a complete system. You're going to have to interface this with the external world, and, and for many applications, that in itself is going to be a challenge. Being able to come up with a, a network like this is almost a, a, you know, a, a two-edged sword, because um, if, if it works like this, if it's truly unsupervised, continual, et cetera, um, to some extent, it's going to have a mind of its own. I mean, you can kind of point it in a direction. You can, you can summarize the kinds of, or general characteristics of the cluster you'd like to have based on the data input patterns. But um, you don't really have a lot of control of exactly, you know, maybe the number of clusters it finds or how the, the inputs are mapped onto identifiers. It has a mind of its own. And in the, in the various um, um, uh, models that have been put forward of this type, and, and including mine, uh, there's almost always a pseudo-random number generator somewhere buried in that thing. And, and I would argue that, that the pseudo-random number generator is like atomic mind of its own. It's, it's, I think it's really kind of an inherent kind of thing you're going to have here. So just a brief outline. I'm, I'm going to talk briefly about the biological neocortex. Because we're reverse architecting, I'm going to say a little bit about computer meta-architecture. And I, and I should say that, that I, I take sort of the expansive, you know, Glenford Myers view of computer architecture, where it extends all the way from, from essentially CMOS circuits all the way up to application software. And architecture is all about defining interfaces and abstractions. And so I'm going to discuss the, the first primitive abstraction, the really critical one, the one getting from the biology into the computational domain. And then I'm going to, I'm going to briefly discuss the next layer up, which in, in, to, be, to be analogous to, to computer design, it's like, sort of like the register transfer level. Um, I have some slides on mathematical underpinnings, digital CMOS implementation. Depending on how much time I take elsewhere, I, I may or may not get to that. 
but uh, I'm going to make the, um, the slides available, and it's, on the, it's in the slides. Also, a lot of the, that material is in a, uh, an ISCA paper from, uh, from last year. So just a brief overview of the uh, biological neocortex. The neocortex is, is essentially a new shell that, that surrounds the older, you know, inner brain. And it's the neocortex we're interested in. It's, it's the thing that does the sensory perception, cognition, intellectual reasoning, generates high-level motor commands. It's, it's the thing that we really want to be able to emulate. Physically, it's, it's, it's thin, only two to three millimeters, 2,500 uh, square centimeters. As uh, Hawkins says, it's like the size of a, of a dinner napkin. The folds are there to increase area, just one example of the, of the great engineer that uh, natural evolution is. Um, about 100 billion neurons, 10K synapses each, although mo most of the synapses at any given time aren't actually active, only maybe 10%. Um, there is a physical architecture, and it's generally considered that the physical architecture probably corresponds to a functional architecture. And so, um, what I'm showing here is a picture, you know, similar to ones I'm sure you've seen, which is, which is basically the highest level, uh, which is the, is the neocortex itself divided into lobes, which are, are sort of the next higher level of the hierarchy. Lobes are divided by regions, and so the major regions are, are labeled here in this figure. Regions are divided into subregions, lots of layers of subregions. At some point, when we get closer to the bottom, there are macro columns, micro columns, neurons, and I have a few slides, uh, the next slide I'm going to talk about what those are. So now here's the physical architecture from the bottom up. And, and, and in the research to date, we don't get very far from the bottom up. Um, so we have the neuron at the bottom. Neurons are, are organized into micro columns of about 100 neurons each. Um, micro columns are organized into macro columns of, of on the order of 100, sometimes more micro columns. Um, some number of macro columns form the lower level regions, and then you have a hierarchy of regions, sub, you know, regions of regions of regions, until you get up to the lobes and then the full neocortex. A, uh, a neuron, this is actually four neurons. The ones that we're interested in first here are, are the excitatory pyramidal neurons, the, the, the one in the middle there with a shape like a pyramid. You know, neurons are generally you know, named after you know, what they kind of look like. And so uh, focusing on the excitatory you know, pyramidal neuron, there's the body. There are inputs, the dendrites. There's an output, the axon. And, uh, and then the co connection points between the, the inputs and outputs are at synapses. And it's a synapses where the, uh, the kind of the, the learning you know, takes place because the synapses have, have weight or uh, efficacy. Um, OK, so to, to jump immediately into modeling, here's a, uh, an excitatory neuron model that's very commonly used. It's, it's an example of a spike response model due to uh, Kistler, Gerstner, and, and von Hammond, uh, 97. A, a, a lot of this, uh, this work really started kind of in the mid-90s. So uh, there's already like a 20-year history, which when you compare it with, with conventional neural networks is actually short. Um, so um, the, this, is, this is a simple example of the SRM model, the SRM0 model, it's called. And, and the way it works is uh, you, 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 if you apply a volley of, of input spikes or action potential, voltage spikes, uh, at the inputs, and you notice these occur at different points in time, time flows from left to right here. Um, when, when the spikes reach the synapses, they basically open you know, conductive gates, you might say, metaphorical gates. Which, which cause um, the uh, neuron's body potential to rise according to a, to a response function. And uh, the response function amplitudes um, are, are a function of the weights. The higher the weight, the larger the amplitude. Zero weight, there's no response function at all. And the, in, in this model, the uh, response functions are summed linearly in the body and if the sum ever reaches a, uh, a threshold level, theta in this example, then an output spike is emitted. In some cases, you never reach the threshold, there's no spike. Now, one, one of the, the, the beauty of this, of this model from a, uh, from a kind of a theoretical you know, modeling perspective is that you can use any response function. And I've shown four of them here. The one, the one at the top there is a, is a bi-exponential function. It's, it's closer to the biology 
And um, you'll notice I put those discrete dots there, and that's because I, I model this thing uh, in, uh, I, I model this thing as a sort of a coarse grain, uh, discrete um, model, because the actual, uh, the, the actual biology only has a resolution or precision of about three bits. You know, four would really be stretching it. And so I start out from the beginning with a uh, sort of a coarse grain, discrete model. It's, it's immediately a, a kind, it's, it's a basically a, uh, a, uh, an integer model that's based on uh, discrete mathematics. And that, and that in some ways sets this, the work I've done apart from other people working in this field, which uh, starts with uh, you know, real mathematics and the discretization doesn't happen until you convert it to floating point. I start out with, with, with a coarse grain discrete model from the very beginning. Okay, other, other response function, there's this, on, on, the, on the left there in the middle, there's this triangular thing, which is sort of a piecewise linear approximation to the bi-exponential. There's, on the, on the right there, there's a, there's a step no leak function, which a lot of uh, people actually use. On the bottom, there's a, what I call a ramp with no leak, which happens to be the model that I'm, I'm currently using. Well, so, so if we're gonna reverse architect, let's um, talk meta-architecture. Okay, so engineering, as, as, as all the people here know, engineering highly complex systems requires abstraction. And uh, conventional computer architecture, again, taking the sort of the broad view of architecture, contains lots of levels of abstraction. And if we kind of briefly walk through those, there's a, at, at the very bottom, there's this really fundamental abstraction from, uh, from electrical, you know, CMOS into the logical domain, logic gates. The next layer in, in the computer, in the conventional computer domain is to what we typically call the register transfer level or RTL level, where the, where the blocks are, are ALUs, you know, shifters, counters, um, registers, things of that sort. And um, I guess my observation here is that w when we do computer design, we don't literally design with gates. We uh, instead more, you know, start more at the register transfer level and then from the register transfer level, we build functional blocks and blocks of blocks of blocks until we have the entire computer hardware system. And then there's another you know, fundamental abstraction from hardware to software where, where, we, where we shift into machine language. And again, we don't write code in machine language. We use the next higher level, HLL statements. We write procedures and procedures and procedures, oops, until we get all the way you know, up to the top of the, of the hardware stack. So we have these sort of fundamental abstractions where, where it seems to be just all we can do to kind of get over the hump, to get through that abstraction, and then we kind of design at the next layer. And then once we're there, we just sort of stack up layers in a kind of a uniform way. Okay, well, in the, in the, in the, in the neural architecture, again, we're gonna, we're gonna have to rely on levels of abstraction. If, if there are no layers of abstraction, it's from, from, our, you know, from the human perspective trying to understand this, it'll probably be hopeless. Um, fortunately, as we've seen, the physical architecture actually kind of is, has been good to us. You know, it, it is divided into blocks of maybe 10 to 100, you know, uh, each block is maybe 10 to 100 lower blocks. And um, in, in this case, we're starting with the biology, with biological neurons, and the first critical step is... Um, from, from, the, from the electrical, you know, biological circuits. They're electrical in the sense, it, it's ions and, and uh, biological materials. It's not, it's not electrons and copper, but they're electrical nevertheless. Um, so so that, there's that first fundamental abstraction to, uh, to the model neurons, and then we, we get, we get to, 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 as I said, microcolumns, columns, regions. There's a region hierarchy. Um, if I want to, to, to widely, you know, wildly speculate, there's probably another layer, sort of fundamental layer of abstraction somewhere, um, because at, at the lower level, as we're going to see, the, the computation is primarily temporal, and we don't usually think in temporal ways. Whenever, whenever we have to reason about something that's temporal, we tend to cast it first into spatial terms, and I've already done that. You know, when, when we show, you know, this diagram with time going from left to right, and we show the waveform we've converted a temporal thing into a spatial thing. And we, we do that so often and so much we, we, we don't think about it. So, so, so if, if the lower level processing is temporal and the higher level thinking is spatial, something is happening in between. And uh, 
it may be decades before we figure out what that is. But when we're able to cross that threshold, that's where we have something that's really uh, an intelligent you know, device. Okay, so, so the roadmap, uh, here's the long-term roadmap. We'd like, we'd like to start at the bottom of the stack, do the primary abstraction, and then just work our way up the stack. Um, uh, so, um, and, and, and we're going to, in this talk, we're going we're to start that process. I'm going to do the first primary abstraction, do the next layer into columns, and at that point, we're pretty much going to be at our first milestone, which is that temporal neural network. In, in terms of definition of terms, uh, I used to avoid the, the word neuromorphic because it just, you know, it, it, it was, I don't know, a little bit too fancy for me, maybe. But I've, I've come to uh, embrace it. Because I, I, you know, I, I define a neuromorphic architecture as being something that implements the paradigm. And, I, and, I've, and I've tried, and, and one reason I've embraced it is I've separated it from neuromorphic circuits, where a neuromorphic circuit is simply an electrical circuit that functions in ways that are similar to neurons. And this is one way you can implement architecture, the neuromorphic architecture. But you don't require neuromorphic circuits, and this is the important point, to implement neuromorphic architectures. Okay, neuromorphic circuits typically are, you know, actually literally use voltage spikes. They're, they tend to be more custom kinds of circuits. You don't literally need to do that in order to achieve a neuromorphic architecture. Near term, let's focus on that first abstraction. You know, look at results from experimental neuroscience. Consider models from theoretical neuroscience, and, and quite a bit of work has been done. And, I've, I, and most, of, most of this talk is actually drawing from models that, 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 that exist in theoretical neuroscience. But, but I guess the challenge comes in, there's so many of them, and so many things have been put forward, the challenge is in deciding which ones to use and which ones not to use. Which ones make sense to you, which ones don't. Okay, so, so then, you know, sort of, you know, assimilating all that, you know, sort of, you know, information that's out there, postulate a set of basic elements, and then use those to develop these sort of quasi-standard building blocks, kind of the RTL that I've been calling it, because it's, it's, it's highly analogous to RTL. And then use these to construct an experiment with the, with the, with the major milestone TNN that we're trying to do, that, that unsupervised, continual, you know, highly energy efficient thing that we would really like to have. That's the first major milestone, deep TNNs. And so, so as you're doing this research, there, there, really, all, really there are three layers that are, all, that are in play. The way you model the neurons, you want to be able to kind of tweak those and you know, see how that fits in the, in the grand scheme. And then, and then the RTL, the, what, what I call columns, and then the actual macro column level. So, so the, the sim, in simulation and doing the day-to-day you know, -day experimentation, you're kind of working between these three, these three layers at any given time. Okay, so here's that first, that, that first layer of abstraction. And, and, and the, the point I want to make here is there aren't that many architecture elements to keep track of. If, if you, if you can, can model and deal with these five, that's a, a, a really good place to start. It may even be sufficient. I don't know. So I'm going to go through each of these in, in turn. The first is, 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 is uh, temporal coding. And that is, the, the, the idea here is that information is, is communicated by transient events, in the case of the, of the neurons, voltage spikes. But they don't have to be voltage spikes. The, the, the point is they're transient events in time, and, and the relative points in time are what mark out the values. And so from here out, I, when I say spike, uh, from, a, from a high level you know, computation perspective, it doesn't literally have to be a voltage spike. It's, it's a transient event. It's just convenient to call them spikes. So, Values are encoded by spike timing relationships, beginning, and, and, and here I'm showing in this diagram a volley of spikes. Time is again going from left to right. Here's a, a case of where I've, you know, I'm showing time as, as space, because that's the way we think. Um, so, so, so at t equals zero, the first, when we have this sort of volley or wave of spikes, the, one, the first one at t equals zero, we're just going to give that the value zero. And then all the others are relative to that. So you see the second from the bottom, that's like one unit time. That's a one. And uh, what the, the fourth from the top happens to be a four, value four. Um, in many cases, a, a particular line, you know, that the, uh, the uh, axon to dendrite connection doesn't have a spike at all. 
And I'm showing that with the infinity symbol. Um, it, it, if you want to think of it intuitively, it's sort of the spike that happens infinitely far in the future. And, um, and, 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 and two comments here. This, this is not a toy example. I mean, I, again, we're, we're using a coarse grain, discrete model. So, 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 the, so the simulation that I do it just, uses, just uses small integers. You know, synaptic weights range from zero to eight. And another point is that in practice, in the, in the, uh, as you get into the, into the network, the coding is actually sparser than this. There are a lot of infinities, which, which matches the biology. It, it leads to efficiencies and, and, and so on. Now, a kind of a key point here is that the, the flow of time in this kind of model where we're using, we're using time differences to mark out values, the flow of time can be used as a communication and computation resource. And from an engineering perspective, the flow of time has you know, ultimate advantages, okay? Time requires no space. It consumes no energy. And the flow of time is free. It flows all the time whether you want it to or not. You know, you, you can kind of feel it, right? It's flowing. But when we, when, when, we, when we design conventional computer systems, we try to eliminate the effects of time. It's almost like time you know, delays are, are our enemy. So we use, we use synchronizing clocks, delay-independent asynchronous circuits um, to sort of remove the effects of time from the equation. And, and I'm not suggesting that we should have done otherwise. It, it may be that for the kinds of computing problems that, we, that we're interested in solving, for the technologies that we have, this is a good engineering choice. But natural evolution, when it was developing the neocortex, was looking at a different set of computing problems. I mean, the reason we're interested in this in the first place is it can do things that normal, ordinary computers can't do. And it had a different technology. So, it, it, so, so, the, so the thesis is that natural evolution used time as a resource because it has all of these advantages. We want to briefly compare this temporal coding with, with quats, uh, another sort of alternative that people have proposed, and this was actually, I think, kind of the genesis way back when of neural networks, is use rate codings. It, it, if you were to tell an engineer on the street that you're going to use you know, voltage spikes to communicate information, this rate method is probably the one they would come up with. They would almost assume that's what you're going to do, where, where, the, where the relative rates of spikes encode the values. On this diagram here, then, I, what I'm showing is the, uh, a sort of a rate method of communicating values along with the, with the temporal method that, we, that, we, that I just talked about on the same biological time scale. And what I'm showing here is, is that the, the temporal method, the volley of spikes, lasts about 10 milliseconds. Experimental results show that you can resolve to about one millisecond out of 10. There's that, that three bits of, of resolution. Um, uh, on, on the other hand, uh, you know, from a practical perspective, the fastest rate you're going to achieve is about a, about a um, uh, 100 hertz, 10 millisecond clock period. So these are the same scale. But, but what you see is that the temporal method is an order of magnitude faster, and it's also an order of mag magnitude more efficient. There are two orders of magnitude difference. So, so you know, it's, it's sort of apparent, you know, which the good engineering choice would be. And not only that, but the rate method gen for, for a lot of, of tasks that have been measured experimentally would just be simply too slow. So, so the temporal method has, has significant broad experimental support. The rate method does not. Okay, the, the temporal neural network model is basically um, the, the, the one that I'm using and other people use. It begins by encoding an input pattern into into, into the temporal, you know, into temporal, um, the temporal encoding, a volley of spikes. And um, again, as, as, a, as an initial model, the, 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 uh, the, the temporal neural network, network uh, computes as a, uh, as a, essentially as a wave front of spikes that sweeps from input to output at most one spike per line per computation. And you can kind of see here that the spike times that I'm showing, you know, monotonically increase. There are some infinite infinities in there. Again, in, in reality, it'll be more, more sparse than that. At the output, you have the output, in, again, in temporal form, and you're going to have to decode it back into a, a sort of a human understandable version. Um, now, so, so what this is is a form of spiking neural network. 
But I want to, but I want it to show how the, this, this temporal neural network separates itself from other proposed spiking neural networks. And so I have a neural network taxonomy. Uh, the first two branches of the taxonomy is, is you know, I, 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 the taxonomy is based on theory, implementation. The classical neural networks, at least originally, were based on rates. The, um, the values that are communicated have the same sort of mathematical properties of rates. So, so, so classic neural networks, all the way to deep convolutional ne neural networks, rate theory, rate implementation. If, if I were to characterize those with three sort of keywords, uh, classification, supervised, compute intensive. One class of SNN is, is the same theory. The only difference is, rather than abstract the, the, the individual spikes to a value, a rate, they leave them as spikes, use a spiking neuron to do the computation. So, so they have the same classification, supervised, same applications, compute intensive. However, accuracy becomes a struggle. You know, these, these, these networks have had, had a, a great deal of difficulty matching the accuracies of the, of the conventional neural networks. And energy efficiency is in doubt, I would say, because yes, an, an individual spike is, is low energy, but when you, when you do rates, you have lots of spikes to compute a value. Um, energy, energy efficiency is in doubt. There's also a br branches in taxonomy which use temporal coding, which is what we, we're talking about, and use spiking neurons, but they borrow training from conventional networks. In some cases, they, they literally train a conventional network and then take the weights and move them into the spiking you know, temporal network, perhaps with some transformation. Same applications, you know, same keyword, accuracy is a struggle, but you probably do get energy efficiency. The thing we're looking at is this one, where the training is different. It's localized, unsupervised. The, the keywords now are clustering, unsupervised, simple dynamic. Accuracies, you know, improving on accuracy is not the point. It's the learning. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the new, you know, learning capabilities. There are probably some energy efficiency benefits. For completeness, as I'm cycling through the primitive elements, here's just a repeat of the, of the excitatory neuron we talked about. Inhibition is, isn't, isn't really the dual of excitation. When, when, and, and, and inhibition, reduces the body potential of a neuron. It, it sucks potential out, and has the, so it has the opposite effect of excitation. But inhibitory neurons tend to act in mass over a large volume. Someone's called this a blanket of inhibition. And, so, so you, and, and they don't have to be as precise as excitatory ones. They're not, the, the, the excitatory neurons are doing the computation. Inhibitory ones are more of a, a, more of a control. And so a few inhibitory neurons can control you know, a lot of excitatory ones. And, and, and a typical uh, inhibitory neuron may synapse with the same excitatory neuron thir in 30 different places, including on the body, including on the axon. So when inhibition kicks in, it, it sucks the potential out of that neuron really fast. And it basically throws a blanket of inhibition over the, over the thing. Actually, in, inhibition works at, sort of at the column level. It, 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 it uh, diminishes the potential of all the excitatory neurons within a column. This is typically modeled as a winner-take-all inhibition. And I've got a little, anim little animation here which you have to look closely. So I have, you know, I have uh, three spikes coming into to a set of excitatory neurons. And th when the first one goes through, it triggers a sort of this kind of feedback thing which, which throws this blanket of inhibition over the excitatory neurons. So only the first spike gets through. Only the one that actually triggered the inhibition gets through. The others get nullified, if you like. And so it's winner take all. The first one get through is the winner. And, 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 it, and it should be observed that this mechanism is probably built into a, a sort of a soft synchronization method, which I'm not going to talk about. But, but there, there are these, um, the, the brain is always sort of oscillating. And this, these oscillations are generally inhibitory oscillations that kind of control in a sort of a soft way that, you know, that, and, and synchronize the, uh, the operation. I've got a reference that, you know, to, a, to an interesting paper on this, if you're interested. OK, STDP, spike timing dependent plasticity, that's where the magic is. You know, if we're saying this is all, all about this, new, this sort of emergent, continual, unsupervised learning, this is where it comes from. 
And I'm using uh, STDP here in, in kind of in a generic sense. It, it's, it's the, the, the idea is that, that each synapse updates its weight based only on lo information local to it. Okay, the only thing that a given synapse sees is its, its own input spike. Of course, it's aware of its own weight. The weight is, li is like a finite state machine. The weight is the state. And it, it's also aware that its neuron, the thing it's attached to when it spikes. So that's it. You know, so the only information, does it get an input spike and what, when, when it occurs? Does its neuron output spike and when it occurs and uh, its current weight? And based on that local information alone, it updates the state. There are different ways to model this. I, I use a decision tree where, where, I, where I, you know, there are only really four leaves. Is there an input spike? Is there an output spike? Although the, uh, the upper leaf here, if there's both an output and an input spike, then the, then the actual spike timing relationship depends on whether the, uh, the weight is increased or decreased. So, so um, I, I kind of divide this into a decision tree, whether there is or is not an input or output spike. At the bottom is sort of the, the simple case where if there's no spike at all, the weight doesn't change. Um, I model these things as, as Bernoulli random variables because I'm using, again, a sort of a small integer model, and that, that works well. When you read the, uh, the sort of the, the, the textbooks or the, uh, the papers, everyone focuses on this on the case where there's both an input and an output, and you know, if the input precedes the output, the, and you increase the weight, if the input comes after the output, you know, it had nothing to do with the output, so you decrease the weight, everyone focuses on this. But these other leaves are, are, are vitally important. It's these other leaves, actually, that make or break the, the, uh, the paradigm. Here's a simple example. What's this telling me? That I have no internet? Okay, I can live with that. We don't need the internet. Um, here's a simple example. I'm, this is a, uh, a synaptic you know, crossbar. So I have inputs at the left, the, uh, the neuron bodies and outputs are there on the right, and it's connected with a full crossbar with synapses at every cross point. And I'm not showing the zero synapses. They're, you know, every cross point has a synapse. I'm only showing the non-zero ones. I'm assuming the, and, and this model, and, and, you know, and generally people model it this way, the, the, the weight distribution tends to, to the bimodal. Synaptic weights tend to either be zero or the max. And um, so in this simple example on the, on the input there, I'm showing three inputs with spikes at time zero. So they're not like logical zeros, they're time zero. And the dashes are like the infinity cases. There's no, there's no spike. And when you apply patterns to this thing, STDB will sort of magically configure the cross points into a decode array in such a way that the most frequent patterns will be decoded and the less frequent patterns won't. So, so in this case, let's assume it's already, been, it's already been trained or has proceeded into training. Um, in this particular instance, when I apply you know, the, the three spikes on inputs two, three, and four, they match three maximally weighted synapses. And if, in, in this simple example, I'm using the step no leak. So I'm, I'm kind of, in a way, I've kind of removed time from the equation, but for simplicity. So if I use a step no leak, their total weight will be 12. So they'll lift the uh, potential to 12. The threshold is nine. You'll get an output spike. And because it's step and no leak, it'll happen at time zero. Now, if you use you know, more sophisticated um, functions, and uh, in the general case, we're going to actually decode clusters rather than individual patterns. And so uh, as you apply a pattern, you'll get, um, for, 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 you know, you'll de decode out the clusters. The stronger the match for the cluster, the, strong, you know, the more high-weighted synapses, the earlier the output spike. OK, now, those are all the elements of the model. We're going to put those together and, and build neural networks. So I, I, you know, I, I think there's a lot of room for uh, skepticism that, that a model for something as complicated as this sort of mess that's on the left of these, all these neurons and that are entangled with dendrites and synapses and axons, how, how can you have such a simple model to, that will um, characterize something that looks this complicated? So let's again, let's, let's sort of go, go to uh, digital logic as an analog and look at this circuit, which is kind of become one of my favorites. Now that's also a real, you know, kind of entangled mess. 
Um, and I've kind of intentionally, you know, sort of entangled things to make it, and, and, and I've labeled the inputs in kind of a generic way. But if you're faced with this circuit, even an experienced logic designer, I think, would be hard pressed to say what it does. This is what it does. It's a half adder. You know, one, one of the first circuits you learn when you're uh, in, in logic design 101. It's a, it's a half adder that uses a really clever method called quadded logic, which, which was de you know, developed in the 60s. It's basically a way of uh, interleaving a sort of redundancy with computation in such a way that if you get any failure on a line, it'll be corrected within, within I, th I think, two gate levels. And so if, if, you, if you perhaps use redundancy of maybe four or even more, and, you're worried, and you look at transient failures, this, even if you pepper this thing with transient failures, it'll still work. Well, you know, the brain is notoriously unreliable. You know, neurons are notoriously unreliable. So I, there's, there's really no question in my mind but what it must use some similar kind of technique. There, there's, there, redundancy is entangled with, the, uh, with, with computation. It, 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 as I say here, it's, it, computation is inextricably combined with an obfuscating infrastructure. Now, you wouldn't teach a beginning logic design student that thing at the top, okay? You'd do the thing at the bottom. You know, you'd assume perfect reliability and, and, and talk about the actual paradigm. And, and we're, you know, we can do that. In the computer architecture lab, when we're studying this thing and doing simulations, we can assume perfectly reliable components, and that alone will remove a lot of the complications. And there are other things there. You know, there, there are mechanisms to provide temporal stability, and, uh, you know, and well, who knows what else. So uh, the model is simple because we're trying to extract the paradigm from all the complicating infrastructure. And this is the sort of thing, it's not, you know, you have to kind of use your own sort of researcher's judgment, I guess, as far as how you do that. Okay, also now that I've laid out these sort of primitive elements, I want to kind of give credit where, where credit is due. This is, this is a pantheon of neuroscience architects. They don't, these are people who don't consider themselves to be architects, but that's what they're doing. Um, and, and all the, these principal components I've talked about have, have been put forward, many of them, 20 years ago. So I just want to kind of list these very quickly. There's, there's Simon Thorpe and his students and his students' students. There's actually a large number of them who were, who were one, some of the first people to look at temporal coding, STDP, and TNN architectures in general. And it's this group more than any other that's kind of carried the torch through the, uh, through the past 20 years. There's Wolfgang Moss, a really top theoretician who, who uh, first defined, he called them SNNs, what I'm now calling TNNs, because SNN, the name SNN is kind of broadened out to all these other things. Henry Markram, you know, famous guy. He's kind of an all-rounder, both experimental and theoretical. He, uh, put, he did some of the first experimental work that established STDP. Kind of in parallel, almost independently, Gerstner, who was a, really a top-notch modeler, came up with a sort of a model for STDP. And they, these two kind of, his model kind of predicted what Markram came up with. And Gerstner also has done a lot in neuron modeling. Sander Boda I like just because he's done some interesting architecture, he's written some survey papers that are quite good. And then Singer and Fries, this is the, uh, the work on inhibitory oscillations. If you want to kind of get an, a big picture for how the thing works as a, as a computing device, this is really a good paper. And I guess the only, you know, kind of an, as an observation, all of these people are working in European research labs. Okay, so we have these elements. Let's now try to move up to the next layer, column, layer, column level. Um, this is what, I'm, what I call a computational column. But essentially, all the people working in this space do something that looks just like this one way or another. The dimensions may be different, you know, the, uh, uh, the way STDP is done may be different, but they all kind of look like this. And this is the thing that, that, that learns and maps inputs having similar features to what I'm calling cluster IDs here. Okay, the input lines, if you want to give them a kind of a machine learning interpretation, the, the presence or, the, the, so each input line kind of corresponds to a feature. And the presence or absence of a spike indicates the presence or absence of a feature. The timing of the spike indicates the strength. The earlier the spike, the stronger that feature. The cluster ID in this model, and you know, to keep things simple, is basically a one-hot ID. There's only one spike that's going to come out. 
and it's also temporal. The better the match, the better, the closer it is to, to the, you know, the, the better match it is with the features that identify the cluster, the sooner the spike. And then, as an, you know, then also then, because we're going to stack this up in a hierarchy, a, a cluster ID output at one layer becomes a feature, you know, going in to the next layer. Okay? So I'm laying out a roadmap. So here's some waypoints on the way to our first, you know, major milestone. We have, to do an, we have to decode inputs. We have to take input images, in this case, map them onto to, uh, volleys of spikes. At the first layer, the, so after that first translation, typically you're going to have dense volleys. And so the first layer maps you know, as, as a sort of a dense to sparse mapping. And from there on, it's going to be sparse. So, so we have layer one, which is dense to sparse. Layer two is sparse to sparse. It may be, it also may be kind of a special case, maybe not, but at some point we would hope to have a general sparse to sparse column. And then at the output there's going to be a sparse to question mark, to whatever it is that's kind of application dependent. And so to achieve our, miles, mil, our major milestone we have to hit each of these waypoints. Waypoint zero input encoding, just very quickly, let's use our, our MNIST, you know, numerals. Um, I just basically leverage biology. I use the equivalent of on-off retinal ganglial cells where you, have a, where you have a center with a surround and depending on the contrast, either, either the center is, 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 is brighter or less bright. You know, there's the on and there's the off. You basically uh, do a, 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 what, what amounts to edge detection, which works remarkably well. So what I'm showing here are the first, what is it, eight MNIST numerals with the on and the off. And um, in, in the work I'm doing now, I basically, I, I take away time from the primary inputs. I basically binarize the input, and I do this so I can, so I can more clearly, you know, look at temporal computation. I want to isolate any temporal effects from the inputs, so all the temporal effects at the output of the first layer are due to the computation. Because I, I have to know, I, I, I want to know how... Um, I want to know how you know, temporal values are, are, are produced, so when I, when I go back and put temporal values into the inputs, I kind of know exactly how to map the uh, different you know, pixel intensities, let's say, to a spike timing. It isn't necessarily an, an obvious linear mapping. In fact, I don't believe it is. Okay, so, so, so at the top there are the full images. Uh, at the bottom there are six by six receptive fields. I, I think machine learning people call these patches uh, taken from the center. Here's, uh, so waypoint one is this dense to sparse computational column, unsupervised clustering. Um, again, so that's six by six. So here's just sort of, sort of arbitrary inputs to go in. And uh, after the thing has uh, been running for a while and it's done a little bit of learning, here is a, uh, the this, this, this synaptic weight matrix. Black is the maximum weight, white is, is zero. And um, this, these are the actual, this is the actual matrix. At, at when, when you first start applying inputs, it only takes just a, a small number, at, at most a few hundred, and, the, and the, the, the most common clusters are already generating outputs that can be passed up. Some of the more rare clusters, you know, take a lot more cycles to fill in. Uh, not, these aren't just pure black and white. You know, some of them are kind of shades of, you know, light gray. Well, that's because this thing is always learning. There's this kind of stochastic bubbling that's taking place. They're always kind of on the lookout for a change in pattern so they can, you know, can grab it and, and change the cluster. So you're always going to see a little bit of sort of stochastic bubbling activity going on. And then here are the outputs in this example. You know, and it, basically you can kind of see how it sorts the uh, inputs into, into similar, uh, sorry, similar patterns into the same cluster. Um, and here I'm pointing out sort, sort of the, the, the state of the art for this this is a 2018 paper, is, um, you know, this is, this isn't, I'm not doing exactly the way they're doing it, but I'm able to reproduce their results. STDP works, the, you know, or at least for this kind, at least at this layer, and enough to, to so we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. It, it gives us, I think, a reasonable optimism that this thing is actually gonna, gonna play out. Um, what we would really like, though, is what I'm calling a cookie-cutter column. We'd like to be able to take these computational columns, make an arbitrarily deep, arbitrarily wide network, 
set up the, you know, the parameters, you know, which was going to have to be done by someone who knows what they're doing, and then turn the thing loose, and it'll do all these, you know, wonderful things. This has not been achieved. People writing papers in this area, they spin their work, like we all spin when we write papers, they, they spin their work in a kind of an optimistic way. But, but in reality, this really hasn't been achieved yet. This is where the, the kind of the leading edge is. Okay, so if we, if we, if, you know, if, you know, if we briefly want to look at the research space, if you were, uh, if you want to see, well, you know, how much you know, is there to do? Um, the temporal coding thing, I'm saying that's kind of given. Either either that method or something like it. The excitatory neurons, well, there's a large parameter space. You can look at different response functions. Something worth looking at is maybe some sublinear summation. I think that may have some promise. Inhibition, the winner take all thing, that's a large parameter space. Something, that's, again, it's not talked about much is what happens if there's a tie. You know, if you're using this low resolution thing, you're gonna get a lot of ties. And how you resolve ties actually makes a difference. STDP, I'm calling that a large idea space. That there's, I think, a lot of exploration yet to be done there. Um, the neural networks themselves, it's a large interconnect space. You use full crossbars, partial crossbars, pseudo-random partial crossbars. There's, a, there's a, all kinds of, of, of variations there. There are two things I didn't mention at all. You know, there is some computation that takes place in the dendrites. Um, this may be kind of analogous to uh, pooling. Um, it's, a, it's what I'm calling a, a large idea space that's practically untouched. And then there's compound synapses. Um, a, a, given, a given upstream synapse uh, a neuron synapses with a lower you know, downstream neuron in not just one way, but several. There, there are multiple paths. And it's kind of obvious they're going to have different delays. You know, the chances they have the same delay is almost nil. Okay, so when you take that into account, now you have a, a much more you know, complex you know, space of, res of, of aggregate response functions. That's practically been untouched. Uh, you know, I spent literally years working on that before I kind of backed away and uh, simplified things to uh, simple synapses. Okay, so I I'm getting near the end. I want, I want to, to quickly stick this in because this is, is, is an important part of, uh, of, the, of the whole scheme as I see it. And, and this comes back to what I was saying at the beginning, that, that neuromorphic circuits are not the only way to implement neuromorphic architectures. The, 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 the key thing with spikes is that they're a way of encoding values as temporal events, but you can do that in other ways. Edges are one. So, so a signal change from, from a one to a zero, again, now we're in the logic domain. So, so if you're using normal logic circuits, uh, an, an edge change from one to zero is a transition. It's, it's a transient in time, and you can use those. And when you do that, you can use this thing called, uh, called race logic, and you can wind up actually implementing these, these neural uh, elements with ordinary off-the-shelf CMOS where you're using edges rather than spikes. And so you get a lot of the same uh, uh, efficiencies that you might get with a neuromorphic circuit by using off-the-shelf CMOS. And I'm going to take my shortcut here. The, uh, the ISCA, my ISCA paper from 2018 talks about that, all that, that part of it, the race logic, the uh, a temporal algebra in, in some amount of detail. Okay, so I just have a couple of closing remarks. So if, if you want to do research in this area, and I encourage it, um, you, uh, it's, in a way it's kind of hard to do because you have this, this bright, shiny object of, of successful artificial neural networks, and you're kind of taking, it, you know, you're doing this master reset and you know, stepping back you know, 20 years in time to kind of try to develop this new paradigm. But the barrier to entry is low. The, the actual TNN literature is really relatively small. The development isn't that far along. I kind of said how far along it is. And so there isn't a lot to learn. Uh, it isn't like lots of people have been beating on this. It's actually been a small number of people. The computational requirements are low. I mean, it's supposed to be simple, so it's simple. You know, you don't need a GPU. You know, I, just, I use a high-end desktop that runs multiple threads, and I'm perfectly happy with that. And that's going to get me all the way up to this milestone TNN, I'm sure. And so, 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 so the bottom line is you can get up to speed on this research area in a few months. And a good way to start is to write a simulator because this is, you know, that's, a, that's probably the best way to learn this stuff. So, um, 
I guess, I guess a big part of my message is I'd like to uh, kind of encourage people looking for something really new and different rather than making little incremental tweaks to do something big because, the, again, the research space is huge. Um, this is a, a, a good place to be. Okay, finally, I, I, I think an important question in all this, and, which may affect whether you would want to do research in this area, is are we at a tipping point? Okay, experimental neuroscience has, has spanned over 100 years. The published literature in neuroscience is vast, and it's growing all the time. There's, there, it's almost overwhelming. But, but, but the question is, what if all experimental research were to cease tomorrow? Do we already know enough? Is, has enough have we learned enough already to build these networks? Uh, if so, then I'd say that from a computer architecture research perspective, that's a tipping point. We don't need any more. Um, and in my view, we're either already there or fast approaching it. So, um, you know, at the tipping point, we know enough. It's, it's only a matter of combining things in a coherent and effective way. And so let, 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 let me close by saying that if, if you uh, are a, you know, a researcher looking for something where you can make a huge impact, where there's a lot of stuff to be done, but, but, the, but the potential rewards are, are really big, if you believe we're at the tipping point, then I would ask, you know, what are you waiting for? You know, now is the time. You know, don't wait. You know, don't wait until, you know, hoping experimentalists will somehow find some magic thing, which I don't think is going to happen. Don't wait for someone else to do it. You know, now is the time. So, um, that's my last slide. I have a slide here of, uh, you know, bibliography. There's a, there's a monograph that I did for, uh, as a synthesis lecture. If you look at this, be sure to look at the 20, or you already have, look at the 2019 preface, because in the last two years, my, my view on a lot of these things has changed. You know, this is, this is a very dynamic research area. The second thing here is the ISCA, you know, 2018 paper. And then I've got some papers here that are sort of like, mo for the most part, seminal papers. You know, paper by Hopfield, middle 90s. Excitatory neurons, you know, modeling, middle 90s. STDP, middle 90s. You know, there's a theme here. Uh, TNNs, I'm giving, uh, you know, Moss's, you know, seminal work. And, but I'm also giving that state-of-the-art 2018 paper, the... Uh, Paper by uh, um, by uh, um, Fries. Acknowledgements. A lot of people acknowledge. I'll just name a few. My wife Raquel for her longtime support, which I greatly appreciate. Um, John Shen, who I've started to work with uh, recently at CMU Silicon Valley, and um, I'd like to also thank our Eckert Mockley Award winner, Mark Hill, who uh, encouraged me early on. And, um, you know, we all know his technical accomplishments, but um, the uh, contributions he made within Wisconsin and the architecture group are, uh, were tremendous. And I, uh, it's really uh, deeply felt that I thank Mark for, uh, for all he did for the architecture group at Wisconsin. So thank you. I'll be happy to answer questions. So... So we have time for some questions from the audience. Go ahead. Please identify yourself before asking the question. Hi, I'm Jan from Rutgers and Yale Universities. In your talk, it was heavily based on this abstraction of neurons and try to architect how the uh, human brain works. But there is growing amount of evidence in the neuroscience that neurons are not enough to explain how brain works and non-synaptic information transfer and glia cells and astrocytes play significant roles to explain how brain works the, the, and achieve the efficiency. The echo here is so bad, I, I'm, I'm really having trouble hearing you. I don't know how to deal with that. Okay, so the question is whether the other than neuronal cells in human brain that helps to explain how brains uh, achieve their function and efficiency, whether we need to abstract them and include it in this architecture, or whether you think that neuronal abstraction alone can explain it and achieve uh, the, your goals of meeting what well, the human brains do. Uh, uh, the, the philosophy is, uh, uh, that I've taken is to keep it as simple as possible. And so, uh, so, so I tend to add something only if I need it. Otherwise, I assume that it's there for some other reason, that it's there for this infrastructure support that I talked about, for fault tolerance, for temporal stability, for some other thing. 
Okay? So, so, so you have to kind of be aware of the literature and what, you know, what people experimentally have determined about the various types of neurons, especially inhibitory neurons. But, but, but my guiding principle has been, has been to keep it as simple as possible, only put something in if I need it. Okay? And then I, then I implicitly assume that if, if, if I don't need it, it must be there for something else. Other people take different philosophies. Thank you. Question over here. Hadi Esmail UC San Diego. Sorry about the noise. Uh, very inspiring talk. Thank you. I had a question. Like, it seems like uh, what you presented was mostly based on analysis of human brain. So we have simpler organisms, insects that, uh, you know, have simpler ne nervous, uh, you know, tissues and they accomplish certain, like, you know, complicated tasks. Have you or anybody else, like, uh, looked at validating some of the theories that you have by looking these, uh, to these uh, simpler organisms or, uh, like, uh, is part of the modeling taken from uh, such uh, you know, uh, such organisms in nature. Well, yeah, there's some work that I'm aware of, like insects, sphinx moths are kind of interesting kind of creatures. Um, to some extent, this, your, 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 your question touches on an issue that kind of separates, I, I would view, sort of the computer architecture research like I'm doing from what the neuroscience, theoretical neuroscientists are doing. The, the theoretical neuroscientists, as in, as in many sciences, had this interplay between experiment and theory. I, 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 from, from the computer architecture perspective, it's a little bit more asymmetric. You know, if, if I don't, I don't, I, something does, it isn't required that something be experimentally verified before I use it. I'm perfectly willing to come up with something that may or may not be there, okay? and use it. In other, in other words, my standard is not that it's, uh, whether it's verified to be plausible that it's there, it's more like it's not implausible, okay? And, and, and it's certain, you know, that isn't unlike what happened with the original neural networks. You know, they kind of went off in a direction that, that kind of separated themselves from the actual biology, but it led to really good things. I'm, I'm willing to do that, you know? Although what I've found is, if I separate myself from plausibility too much, that's usually a sign that I'm on the wrong track, and I wind up kind of getting back, you know, back to something that's closer to plausible, or at least not, you know, sort of provably implausible. Thanks. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you for your inspiring talk. Um, and I was mainly wondering, yesterday we heard, heard at the uh, Turing Lecture where we had a question that um, whether it's possible to explain uh, neural networks, deep neural networks, and basically the answer was no, because we don't understand the brain. So you're working on understanding the brain. Do you think that understanding deep neural networks is something that is another milestone in your project, or do you think it's mostly orthogonal? Per, you know, perhaps. I mean, it would, it would be great if this could actually feed back into, into neuroscience. Um, although I thought the, uh, the answers you got from the speakers were pretty good answers, you know. Um, I, would, I don't know that I, that, I would, that I would say much that's different. I, I think in the end, we're not going to totally understand how this works, especially when you get sort of higher up in the hierarchy. You know, as I said earlier, you have this, you know, this uh, pseudo-random number generator buried in there, and that alone is going to you know, kind of you know, make things, uh, you know, what I said, it's, you know, sort of it has a mind of its own. And so I don't, you know, I'm not, I don't know that, uh, I, let, let, me, let me put it a different way. It may be inherent that we don't really kind of understand how it works totally. It's almost, it may be almost like the uncertainty principle, you know, that it's, it's, it's sort of fundamental to having this higher level knowledge that we don't know, you know. It's, it, I, th I thought about this some. You know, I'd like to think that at least sort of in an informal way you can kind of explain what's going on, and you see some of that in, in this talk. But ultimately when you get higher, when you get beyond TNNs, when you get way up in that stack, maybe several decades from now, at some point, I don't think anyone is really going to know how it works. You know? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's thank Jim for uh, his wonderful talk. And thank you. And now it's time for lunch. Oh. Can I have one? No, uh, we can't take more okay. questions. You can take it offline.
Okay, so uh, no. in your talk, like, <laughs> sorry about that. Okay. Uh, so, as from your talk, I understood that like a neuron is connected to maybe like thousands of other neurons. Yes. Right. Yes. And they are communicating with each other, right? Yes. So let's map it to a processing element, and there is a processing element, then it's probably communicating to thousands of other processing elements, right? Mm -hmm. There's lots of communication happening. Yes. And brain takes 20 watts of power, right? How we are going to achieve that? Well, yeah. With this think, extent I think, of... I think this point is just you and me. Um, you may not achieve 20 watts, but, you know, but our technology, it is a different technology we're going to be using. We're going to be using silicon. We can deal with 200 watts. You know, I, I, think, I think we'd be willing to compromise and use 200 watts and we'd be happy, right? It, it, it is a different technology, so I, I don't think anyone is saying we're going to match it to 20 watts, but I think we're going to get something that's really efficient. Okay, so there's another philosophical question. Uh, we have been studying theory of relativity maybe for like more than 100 years now.